Hello, my name is Ken Gibb. I'm the director of the UK Collaborative Centre for Housing Evidence. I'm going to do a short video now talking about the pandemic, the rented sector and UK responses. I think it makes sense to start by saying a little bit about the UK private rented sector as background. So what sort of key facts would we point out to? Well, first of all, Private rented sector is highly deconcentrated. There are literally millions of landlords, many of whom have only one or two units in their portfolio. And so they are often amateur landlords, heavily dependent on the quality of local letting agents. This is all slowly changing. Private renting is part of one of the key changes that have happened to housing in the last 20 years in the UK with the sector rising, growing rapidly doubling and in some cases trebling in, in size. What's distinctive about this though is it was largely unplanned and not the kind of policy change that was directly programmed in or indeed intended by government. Um, another feature of the private rental sector is that although fewer private tenants than social tenants receive housing benefit, it costs a lot more because of the level of rent. So government has for many years now been trying to find ways to cut benefit back particularly in the austerity period and that problem is one that kind of haunts some of the COVID policy questions going going forward as we'll see. Another feature about private renting that's very important is that the regulatory environment and indeed substantive ways in which the rental market works differs massively across the UK. In particular in England there is still uh, no fault uh, evictions whereas that in Scotland no longer really pertains because of a new indefinite tenancy agreement for standard tenancies in Scotland as well as a whole range of regulatory infrastructure which sets Scotland apart. What this means in practice is that the sector is quite varied uh, in terms of affordability and cost, in terms of security that tenants feel they have and have in, in law and also in terms of the quality of the accommodation that they live in. And I think Peter Kemp's old analogy that uh, landlords in the private rental sector in Britain were either conscripts or volunteers definitely also applies to the demand side and to tenants. There are many tenants who are there because they can't be where they really want to be in other tenures, but there are an unknown but increasing number of people who are quite comfortable and relaxed living in the private rented sector. Another point I think that's very important about private renting is that uh, it's really the place where housing change happens first. It's a pressure valve, it's the sector that accommodates shifts elsewhere in the housing system and because of that complexity it's the place where regulatory compliance is most important but also most difficult to enforce on a consistent basis. And uh, the other thing I think I'm I would say I think it's fair about the private rental sector is that locally but also to some extent nationally we lack a robust consistent evidence base either one that operationally helps us do local housing planning but also one that helps us think about the effectiveness of interventions. So one of the points I didn't really raise there about private renting is this idea that it's really a very segmented structured part of the housing system and in the diagram here, I've got several demand side uh, groups and I've also got a number of supply side groups. So uh, I think we're familiar with that range of types of households active in the sector and also landlords. So as I said earlier, vital landlords are the dominant numerically, but we also have important student purpose built housing. We have built to rent investments. We have what we call mid-market or affordable rent, often provided by social landlords. And on the demand side, we have this wide range of people, which includes short-term lets, uh, people living in uh, leased private rented housing because they've been homeless, uh, what we often call generation rent or frustrated homeowners in the rental market, as well as students, as well as key workers and the like. And I really think that the complexity of the rental market uh, means that we should look at it in a slightly different way and I think systems thinking as a perspective is very useful. It highlights the interdependencies across the rental market between these subsectors but also with other 
parts of the housing system and indeed other socioeconomic systems. It reflects the emergent evolution and dynamic properties of the, the market, that the market adapts more or less imperfectly, that it's emergent, it can often make more sense as a collective than it does in terms of individual components, that it uh, will experience both positive and negative feedback so that you can have kind of explosive amplifications of initial shocks, but some other shocks will actually mean revert and go back to the initial starting point. Uh, so that can that's kind of analogous to uh, you know uh, explosive instability in the housing market, but also to ideas of path dependency and returning to the the path. And it's hard to get off the path that the initial conditions uh, tell us about. Two other points of uh, systems thinking I think are really useful to this discussion of private renting. One are what are called leverage points that Donella Meadows talked about. These are those places within the system where intervention could be highly effective. But the point is we have to really understand how the system works in order to forensically target where that uh, leverage should take place. It's, it's really this idea that policy making has to be consistent with the nature and the complexity of the system. And that's what complexity gaps are about. The idea that if you have multiple issues in your housing system or your rental market that you need to address with intervention. The intervention needs to be as complex and needs to have, it needs to have as many features as the problem. And that's very important when we think about enforcement and compliance, for, for instance. So, sorry for that rather lengthy digression, but I do think that uh, thinking systemically is really useful when we approach policy and practice in the private rental sector. So what are the main kind of interventions that have happened. And uh, again, the diagram's a little bit uh, gratuitous, but the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, we have often said that too much policy is made by an announcement followed by the design of that policy and then a search for evidence when it should really be the other way around. But sometimes there are emergencies and crises. This has clearly been one of those and policy has been made very, very rapidly. And as others have said in other contexts, it's amazing what can be done when there's, when there's a will. So we know that there is uh, obviously assistance with income through paid furloughs, help for the self-employed, increases to universal credit, things of that kind. We know secondly that the private rented housing benefit, local housing allowance, has had its previous value of the 30th percentile reinstated and, and it had been frozen for a period of time. And the Treasury reckons that's going to cost about a billion pounds having done that. It should be said that up until the uh, cuts in 2010, the uh, local housing allowance was, what the, was at the 50th percentile of the broad rental market median uh, rent. So, uh, you know, it has uh, come down quite a lot and this is only a minor uh, improvement in, as far as tenants are concerned. And thirdly, of course, uh, we have legislation that prevents evictions. Different in different jurisdictions, it's 90 days from the end of March in England and it's, I believe, six months uh, in Scotland, for, for, for instance. So how has the different parts of the sector responded? I think it's clear that some parts of it are more exposed to problems with uh, the pandemic than, than others. So the built to rent sector, a place like Scotland, uh, there's a lot of properties being constructed right now in Glasgow and Edinburgh or are uh, on, have, have received planning consents and are waiting to build. Clearly there's going to be a significant construction and investment delay with that part of the market. Secondly, we all know that short-term lets have completely collapsed and in certain specific markets, Edinburgh in our case in particular, that has really big implications for local housing systems. There are also regulatory change in situ and train as well, which may also have big impacts. A third area is significantly impacted by the lack of international travel and uh, the problems that universities face is of course a purpose-built student market and what will be done with those properties that uh, uh, are dotted all over our uh, cities across the UK. That kind of leaves the buy-to-let majority who are exposed but are atomized and deconcentrated and it really to some extent depends on their professionalism, their knowledge of the market, their relationship with their tenants, their relationship with their letting agents as to 
how stickable they will be as landlords and also uh, how much and to what extent they can actually, if they so wish, extricate themselves from the market. All of these things would seem to suggest, as Gavin Wood suggested in the previous seminar, talking about uh, homelessness policies, that the dynamics of the rental market may actually generate some additional supply, which may be useful for things like leasing for the homeless uh, and as, a, as an alternative, as it were, in the short run to uh, social housing. There does seem to be a likely dynamic and a churn that's going to happen in the rental market and an outflow of some kind. All of that is made all the more complicated by the fact that the market isn't really open for business at the moment and certainly moving into home ownership or selling to home ownership is going to be difficult for some time yet. So the classic kind of way of, of analysing these issues is vulnerability really depends on your exposure and your exposure depends on whether your income flows as a business are, are impacted on or whether longer term demand is impacted. So that's really the simplistic way of thinking about these, these, these things, I, su I suspect. The other thing that struck me that will be important for the private rented sector is, again, as was discussed in the homelessness sessions, is that uh, we may see a second spike in homelessness when the current policies unwind, if they're not unwound in a careful, measured, staggered way. So we might have a second level of homelessness increasing uh, in a context of recession as, as well. So they may create some perversely an opportunity for uh, for uh, occupant uh, demand as, as it were. And I want to turn uh, briefly to two specific policy challenges uh, that, are, that seem to be arising. One is that it's very hard to follow the housing debates without hearing regularly a call for rent freezes, a call for rent controls, a call for protecting tenants by putting a cap on the, the rental costs that, that they face. And this is taking place in the aftermath in the UK of quite a lengthy debate, both at UK level and in Scotland, about rent control. Uh, and because of that, CASH, my research centre, is undertaking a, a a substantial international evidence review on rent control. It's still underway, but some of the takeaways that we've got from that uh, are firstly that uh, context, history, regulations, path dependency is very important, and the impact of specific rent controls is very contingent on those factors. It's not simply a matter of taking a textbook and applying results willy nilly, it's actually very, very sensitive to local conditions and history and, and the market. Secondly, as uh, Turner and Malpetsi stressed in their paper in 2003, which is a, a, you know, the paradigmatic uh, rent control evidence review, a key question that nobody really addresses is how competitive is the actual market that you're looking at? Because the degree of competition is critical to the impact that rent controls have on market outcomes. We think that that's a really important issue and one that uh, we actually ought to try to invest some time and resource in researching an index of competition that could be used by housing planners to help think about intervention effectiveness. We also think that the evidence suggests that tenancy rules, a security of tenure, the systems of compliance and enforcement are also all very important as to how rent controls impact on housing systems and outcomes, as are the way in which systems of private renting have feedback loops and spillovers so that rent controls can impact on non-controlled sectors and vice versa. Uh, two more general points I think that come out of thinking about costs and, and the like. One is that it's essential that any kind of rent regulatory system and indeed general regulatory machinery to do with standards and quality and, and landlord-tenant relations, that there is a an appropriate, well-judged uh, system of compliance and re regulation in force that, that actually, in a sense, does what it's supposed to do. And that remains very difficult, again, partly because of the market structure in, in the UK, but also because it's essentially largely local function and that varies considerably around the country. Finally, on the side of helping with high housing costs, I think it's certainly worth revisiting the principle that the local housing allowance should be 
back at the median of the local housing allowance rent distribution at broad rental market areas. Uh, thir the 30th percentile is simply not good enough, in my opinion. Uh, there's a public cost attached to that, but as there is with people uh, struggling to uh, make their way when they have to, uh, when they don't receive enough uh, benefit, even though they would qualify in another tenure for, for all their housing costs to be met. On the other hand, uh, another issue that I know Duncan's very exercised about is the non-profit provision of rental market uh, housing. So we have uh, in Scotland uh, subsidised affordable rent, which competes with the private rented sector owned and delivered by housing associations. This is rent provided for private rented housing provided for key workers. The rent is tied to local housing allowance. There is deep capital subsidy for new build housing or improved housing. Uh, the system, certainly in cities like Glasgow, works extremely well. And there are a number of very strong providers de delivering such housing in Glasgow and Edinburgh. It's been suggested to me that it's the affordable end of the build to rent world, as, as it were. Uh, but it is an expensive use of scarce public funds. It may be that there are better ways to fund it, either through pension funds and equity participation, or perhaps through some form of intergovernmental loans, such as the financial transaction scheme. But it does work very well, and I know there's a number of people who are involved in the event today who can talk further about mid-market rent, both from a business and practice side and from an academic side. So just my final thoughts. What are the, the issues that one's left thinking about uh, after this really rapid review of uh, private renting and COVID? First of all, I think there's no getting away from the, the continuing necessity to uh, learn from the lessons in Scotland about ending no-fault evictions. The, the roof didn't fall in, it wasn't a disaster, the world has moved on, uh, it's a perfectly sensible thing to do, and really, uh, you won't get a much bigger laboratory experiment than an entire country on your, on your northerly border doing it. I think uh, England should get on with it and end no-fault evictions. Secondly, there are a whole range of interesting not-for-profits at play in the private rented sector, and we should learn from them and see where they could be further developed. Social letting agencies, social enterprises operating as landlords, housing associations operating in the affordable rent mid-market sphere as well. All of these things are worth examining and exploring, as is homelessness private leasing sol solutions, as and until there is sufficient social housing to meet the requirements of the homelessness uh, sector, which seems still unlikely that that will happen anytime soon. I'll go back to the Turner Mopetsi paper. I'm really interested in the idea of an index of competition to help compliance, regulation, enforcement, and thinking about interventions to manage rents. I think that's a really useful tool to add to the toolbox of housing planning. And finally, uh, I think I would agree with authors like Christine Whitehead, who would argue that in actuality, second generation rent controls about rent stabilization with vacancy T control in the long term probably don't do very much harm and they protect people from excessive rent increases. And that's probably no bad thing. Thanks very much. I'll stop there.